everyone, and welcome to The Current, the North Central Region Water Network's 12, uh, the Speed Networking Webinar Series. Uh, we're excited to bring to you a webinar today featuring three great speakers on water management during drought. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with the North Central Region Water Network, we are a 12-state extension-led collaboration working to ensure safe and sufficient water supplies by increasing the scope and positive impact of multi-state outreach and research efforts in the, multi in the North Central region of the United States. Uh, the current webinar series, we're in our seventh year of the current webinar series, and it's a one hour speed networking webinar series. So um, we call it a speed networking webinar series because we feature uh, three different speakers all on a singular uh, water related topic that are giving a short taste of some of the work that they're working on, some of their research and programming, um, and a chance to get to know who's working on a different water related topic across the region. So today's issue is water management during drought. Uh, a couple housekeeping items for you before we get started. Uh, so we will have three pres presenters today and we will have a dedicated Q&A time after all three presenters. Uh, we encourage you to submit your questions for our presenters using the Q&A panel, uh, which is at the bottom of your webinar screen. Um, during that, you can ask questions to our presenters, and we also encourage you to ask questions, uh, excuse me, to upvote fellow attendee questions. So if someone asks a question and you have a similar question, be sure to upvote that. We'll be sure to take as many questions as we can after all three presenters and get to those questions that are the most popular first. Um, so the Q&A is really where we're taking questions for our presenters, but we also have a chat feature on the webinar. Um, if you're having any technical issues, if you have questions about the North Central Region Water Network or about the current webinar series, uh, please let us know. Um, and that is really an avenue to do that in the chat or, um, you know, talk among uh, with fellow attendees here today. So we kind of differentiate those. If you are having any uh, audio issues, there is a phone in option that can be accessed by clicking the up arrow on the mute icon at the bottom of your screen and then selecting switch to phone audio. Uh, this session is being recorded and we will post a uh, the recording as well as the presentation slides to our website, uh, northcentralwater.org backslash the current. Um, so you can find both of those available to you afterwards. So uh, very excited today to be talking about water management during drought. We have three great presenters set up for you. Um, first, we're going to hear from uh, Shinwa Jia, uh, who is a professor in agricultural and, bio and biosystems engineering at NDSU. We're going to be talking about um, some of her research and work in terms of irrigation. And then we're going to hear from uh, Joe um, Zolovich, uh, Assistant Extension Professor and Extension Agricultural Engineer at the University of Missouri Extension, talking about livestock water management. And finally, we're going to be hearing from Will Boyer, uh, Extension Watershed Specialist at K-State Research and Extension, who's going to be talking about uh, water management as it relates to livestock and drought, and specifically getting water where you need uh, during drought. So giving one example of some of the work that he's been working on in relation to water management and drought. So without further ado, we're going to introduce our first speaker. We're very excited to have um, Shinwa Jha here with us. Uh, Shinwa is one of our partners on a grant we have um, with uh, watershed management interns, undergrad interns that we're working on across the state. And so we've gotten a chance to work with her a little bit and excited to share a little bit about her research with irrigation. I'm not going to read her full bio there. You can read it for you, uh, for yourself, and we'll have it up online later. So uh, Shinwa, I'll give it over to you. Thank you. Um, can you see my slides okay? It looks great. Well, thank you. Um, so today I will briefly talk about one of our project, one of our projects on remote and automatic drip irrigation for specialty crops. So I'm Xinhua Jian, I work for uh, NDSU. So um, as you all know, that drip irrigation is a method of irrigation that delivers slow, frequent application of water to the soil or near the crop 
uh, at a lower pressure this uh, at a lower pressure and so with that it is also called a micro or trickle irrigation and so what are the uh, pros and cons of this drip irrigation well the best part of drip irrigation is that it has a highest efficiency compared to other methods according to the literature um, because it only irrigates uh, the, the soil. Um, okay, only wet the soil around the plants uh, and also the deep percolation losses are decreased. It will have a very minimum evaporation. But the, the part that uh, stops many people using it is the management. Uh, because it's only deliver a small amount of water uh, to the root zone and the little room for arrow, or you cannot get behind. And also have a high uh, requirement for the water quality. So the management part for the drip irrigation is very critical. So with that, you may want to ask, how am I going to manage the drip irrigation? Well, you can manually turn on and off if you're doing it at your garden, or you can set up um, an on and off cycle with a fixed amount for a fixed duration, uh, use a timer. Well, sometimes people call this timer a controller as well. Well, I call controller is because it has some um, features that can really control the irrigation. It can be based on crop, uh, crop water requirement, or based on soil, which is the soil water status in your soil, or based on the weather conditions. And I want you to turn on and off irrigation automatically. But nowadays, uh, if you work with a, a farmer, they always say that, can I manage the system um, with my phone, which is means remotely. So the, this part is what I'm going to cover for um, um, today's uh, lecture. So you just go to a, a, a web browser and yes, you want to use a controller. So you tap in this irrigation controller. What did you see? You see tons of controllers, so many different kinds, different price. And I know if you were me, you'll be uh, hustled on uh, how I'm going to choose a controller I really want. Well, um, number one is you have to ask yourself, do you really have water? I know a lot of you have that. Maybe some of you don't have it. And probably you can set up a water harvesting system, or you can use a big truck to bring some water uh, to your field. And then if you do have water, you may want to ask yourself, what is the quality of my water? And where in North Dakota, one thing we always pay attention is the source related chemicals that's in the water, uh, because we don't want to um, cause uh, secondary salinities uh, to our field. And also there are biological contaminants. Uh, if you are going to, if you are going to grow vegetables or fruits uh, and you want to pay attention to those. And after that, you want to ask, uh, do I have a power supply near the controller? Um, and uh, the controller, some controllers are battery powered, but most of them are um, um, needing the, the power. So you need to ask uh, what kind of a power supply you have. And then if you want to do want to do the remote control, and then you do need a Wi-Fi near your controller. And if you don't, and then you can, oh, I, I bought a, a mobile Wi-Fi unit and put it next to my controller. So that works fine. And then after all that, you want to ask you, yourself is, what is the frequency of my Wi-Fi system? And uh, because the Wi-Fi and the controller, if they are in the same frequency, yes, they are compatible. If not, and then they just don't work together. And I'm sure that I just uh, listed uh, some of these questions uh, this morning, and you probably have more questions. Feel free to uh, ask. So once you choose the controller, you think everything's working, and there are one more thing that you want to ask yourself is, uh, uh, there are two types of controllers. Uh, one is uh, web transpiration based controllers. Uh, so they can use the historic monthly uh, ET data 
or some uh, nearby weather stations, or uh, you may put some on-site sensors to measure the ET. Oh, uh, most of these ET-based controllers, they also have these uh, ring sensors that go with the controller. And then, you know, for my research, I do specialty crops. There are small plow. I also use mulch. So the controller I use is a soil moisture sensor based controllers. So I can bury this soil moisture sensor at 6 or 12 or 6 and 12 um, inch depths. And then I will schedule the irrigation based on a preset soil moisture or potential stress code. Um, I, I should highlight this sentence because this preset value need additional uh, work to do in the lab. Um, and then you can irrigation, um, you can schedule your irrigation once or multiple times per day. So for my treatment, we started uh, three times per day, and then we ate uh, five times per day. But right now, we are irrigating 12 times per day uh, because we are working with uh, very poor soil. And then when you have this controller, you have to really read the manual carefully if it is irrigated until the threshold is reached. So for example, you set up at 40 kilopascal. So it will irrigate when it's below, but it will stop at that 40 kilopascal. But there are the controllers, it will irrigate when the threshold is reached. For example, if a 40 kilopascal is the threshold, it will irrigate when it reaches or um, above the, the 40 kilopascal and they irrigate at a fixed time based on what you set up. But the previous one, it will irrigate maybe one minute, maybe five minutes or 20 minutes. So it will stop when the threshold is really reached. So that part, you, know, you need to be careful. So this is the, the sensor that I use for my research. And I'm just going to give one example of this uh, automatic remote drip irrigation for commercial productions of watermelon squash and muskmelon in Oaks, North Dakota. And then we set up this automatic drip irrigation for this uh, uh, field. And uh, as I mentioned, that preset of a threshold is very important. So that's why, you know, before the season start, we collected soil cores at different levels, at uh, different depths, and then we measured the soil water content and soil water potential relationship. I know if you don't have that uh, lab capacity, but at least you know what kind of soil you work on, and then you can get this curve from uh, literature. And then uh, the soil click threshold for this uh, ambient fine sandy loam soil for my research site. As you can see, we set up at uh, level two for this 10% um, of management, management allowable deficiency mm -hmm. and three for 30% and seven for 60%, uh, where this level 10, the actual value for the soil for that threshold is about 14. Um, so if you don't have any background in soil and at least you know field capacity and permanent waiting point. So our 10%, 30%, and 60% is, uh, is the 10% below the field capacity. And that's the level we set up. Um, as you can see here, if you set about 10%, means you will irrigate a small amount, but very frequently. Well, for 60%, you irrigate less frequently but a large amount. Of course, we use controller, so it will only trigger the irrigation when it reaches that threshold. So how I'm going to control the irrigation automatically? You know, with the controller, you know, we set up the threshold uh, for uh, on the soil click, and now we set up the time start the irrigation and also the duration of the irrigation on the controller. And then the soil moisture sensor buried in the field connected with the controller. So whatever it reached that threshold, it will trigger the irrigation. 
And then the remote part is um, because the controller uh, comes with a software, it's called the HydroWise. So six o'clock, I wake up in the morning, I will open my cell phone and then check the controller, see whether they are working, whether any problem they are. So I can change the scheduling, I can set up the threshold, uh, not the threshold, set up the timer uh, with this um, um, remote uh, app on my computer, on my cell phone, it can be on the computer. And this is a, a instrument that we use. As you can see that uh, number one is this um, watermark sensors that we buried at six inch below soil surface in the field. And then there will be long wires and, and connected to the controller. As you can see that we use a hunter controller. And then this is the soil clake that we set up the threshold. And then because we're doing research, so we do have a flow meter and we have a, a data locker record how much water that we irrigated and we do have a power source here. And we also have a web camera because I want to see, you know, the overview of whether the crop is doing okay or not. And I did, I mean, we did observe a jack rapids running around and then we put a fence around our plot. And then I will just show you one graph of the preliminary results. Uh, as you can see that from uh, June 15th to July 20th, uh, and the blue bar showing the time-based irrigation. So we will irrigate about 0 0.6 inch of water uh, each day, uh, three times per week, Monday, Wednesday, Friday. And then we also have this 10% um, 30% and 60% management allowable depletion uh, threshold that we set up. As you can see that uh, we get some large irrigation here and uh, they are, you know, the actual amount is lower the time based, but because we irrigate three times per day and that's why the the daily amount is even higher than the time base. That is probably, you know, around July 4th is when this crop really need a high demand of water. And I didn't put rainfall here, I'll probably got some rainfall. That's why we didn't really irrigate too much around that time. And then this is the cumulative amount of irrigation. I only put the mask melon here. I didn't put others uh, uh, because I know have 10 minutes. Uh, and then uh, this is a figure show that the different crops um, that what are the total water that we have been applied. Uh, as you can see that the mask melon and squash, uh, we did use less water if we use a 60% management allowed for deficiency. But for watermelons, we use much more compared to the time based. So from here that I can draw a uh, um, give a summary set this automatic drip irrigation and that can be used for irrigation management and they are so nice because we don't have to go to the field every day to do the management we just open you know turn on my phone do all the management and this drip irrigation with clear plastic mulch uh, gave us the best or the highest watermelon yield uh, based on our uh, uh, three year study in the previous uh, study. And so the irrigation was a large amount, but less frequency at level seven, which is the 80 kilopascal threshold uh, for um, mask melon and squash. Uh, they use less water, but not for watermelon. So that means watermelon does need more water. And this field is also maintained as waste free in the rows with the mulch. And also we did a lot, little bit tillage between the rows. And with that, I would say this project will not be possible without the funding support from North Dakota Department Ag, the specialty crop grant. And also I would like to acknowledge my Cola, I mean, my co-PIs, um, Kelly Cooper, uh, uh, Hetman Walanke, and Tom Sher, and they are also on this project, and also North Dakota Egg Experiment Station, uh, Oaks Irrigation Site, uh, North Dakota Water Resources Research Institute, and my Hatch Project. 
and uh, uh, the last or the most important, uh, this great work will not be done with all this uh, great student. And a lot of the slides are put together is from Abu Wan, uh, my graduate student who is especially working on this project. And we do have another project that's uh, uh, automatic irrigation in the high tunnels. So with that, I'm going to stop here. If you do have any questions, feel free to call me or email me. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Xinhua. Uh, yes, and I do see some questions coming in there um, on the Q&A panel. OK, uh, next up, we have a presentation from uh, Joe. Um, Zolovich with the University of Missouri Extension. Uh, Joe is an Extension Agricultural Engineer and uh, has his professional engineering license in the state of Missouri. He's been working over 30 years uh, with agricultural engineering issues. So we're excited to hear from Joe. He's going to be talking about livestock water management during drought. I will stop sharing and hand it over to you, Joe. Up here, muted. Well, good afternoon, everyone. I think we're ready to go here. I'm going to take a little step back and, and look at water systems for livestock. It, it can relate to drought situations, but it also uh, working with the development of water systems in general. And as I've worked with this, um, as an engineer, I get asked for uh, pipes and pumps pump sizes, pipe size, and so forth. And they say, well, I've got a need and I've got a source. But in order to put a system together, you've got to also know the quantity and quality before you can develop the distribution system. And so looking at a total water system overview, um, <clears throat> the water need and water source uh, is, is typically where the, the producer, the grower, the livestock person thinks about, I've got water I can get someplace and I've got a need uh, for my plants or my livestock or whatever. And in order to get to the distribution uh, that, that I get asked about, we need to know both the water quantity and quality. So the, the sizing is important and, and two, two items that we'll get into is daily use requirement and peak demand. And daily use and peak demand are not always the same number and they do impact um, <clears throat> what happens and uh, we'll see an example on, on that and then how it impacts your, your distribution sizing. Your water quality is a situation of, um, is the source quality equal to or better than what you need? And if not, what kind of water treatment might you need to put in place to make it all happen? And so once you know the sizing and whether you've got to add incorporation of treatment or filtering or something like that, then we can start talking about the water distribution size and so forth. Now in Missouri, I've worked with developing water supplies and um, as a general rule, we've got three potential water sources, uh, groundwater access, accessed by using a well, uh, surface water impoundments and public water. And those are the three primary sources of water availability um, from there. However, uh, as we, since this is a national audience, um, a word of caution about knowing your state water law, are you, a, under in a state where it's riparian water law, or are you in a state that is water use law that you can access water by permit or permission only? And the reason there is a difference is riparian water law means that if there's water on your property, you have the right to use it as long as you don't adversely affect somebody downstream. And so the effect downstream, 
the the idea that you're going to dam up the the creek and no more flow goes on down that's not acceptable but if you want to pull pump some water out of a flowing stream for your use that would be okay uh, development of water impoundments on your property uh, to capture water is is okay uh, but if you're looking at water use law you may not have the the ability or the right to harvest any water in a drought situation and, and go from there. So just a word of caution as to the, um, what type of water law uh, that, that, you're, that you're looking at. So now with your water need, uh, there's really three main points that you need to be aware of. And that's the issue of what is your daily need for livestock inventory? How much water does your does your livestock need on a daily basis? Then you also need to have an estimate on the drinking rate of, anim of animals to estimate peak water demand. So how fast do they drink? How many are drinking at the same time? And that's gonna impact uh, how you put your system together. And then the other one you need to be careful on is what other water uses are gonna be happening at the same time when peak water demand is happening. And so the issue you don't wanna run into is uh, you're supplying water to your livestock, they're drinking water, and you don't have water for other uses on your operation. So you need to be careful on pulling that all together. I'm, these next few slides, I'm gonna go through some uh, primary water uses. Um, for different types of livestock. And here we've got, I've got an outline for swine and the main water uses on a daily basis would be drinking water uh, for the various uh, stages of production on the left and supplemental cooling. And these are, these supplemental cooling numbers primarily are looking at sprinklers or misters uh, to get an idea on how much water uh, per head per day that you're you're going to be using. And these may be low depending on your system, but you need to be aware of how that is. Now the wash water um, is, is, is a set of numbers that I've developed and used over the years that gives us an estimate of how much wash water we're going to need when we clean our buildings. And so this isn't necessarily the water use per day, but if you're going 100 days, and so you'd have 100 times these numbers uh, to get that uh, gallons per head per day or gallons per head, then however large your building is, that's how much water you would need to have on hand. And sometimes the daily water use uh, is in swine operations is really dependent upon uh, the building wash water uh, demand as opposed to the drinking water and supplemental. So you need to be aware of, of how to, uh, how to address that. Here on the dairy side, uh, we've got calves, heifers, dry cows, and milk, lactating cows. Um, the drinking water numbers, um, kind of in the middle of the ballpark. If you've got a dry ration, you might actually have more. Uh, if you've got a more uh, wet ration of silages and so forth, uh, you may have something that's a little bit less. Uh, from from that perspective. And so that's the drinking water kind of gets you in the ballpark, uh, but it's going to be ration dependent. Supplemental cooling, uh, these numbers, these values, and having worked with uh, heat abatement in the dairy industry for a number of years, these numbers tend to be on the lower end uh, as, as far as a well-managed uh, sprinkler system. Uh, to wet the animal, to wet the cows and so forth. Um, <clears throat> I've seen that these supplemental cooling water numbers could be triple of what we have here, depending upon how the management or if you will, mismanagement from a water efficiency perspective could be. Uh, your milking uh, parlor, gallons per cow per day. I've just not seen anybody able to get down much under 10 gallons per cow per day unless you're actually re capturing wash water from equipment wash and recycling it back. You might get down to around five um, and up to 50 gallons per cow per day is not unheard of. Um, 
if you're not careful, you can have numbers in the 100 to 300 gallons per cow per day uh, from that perspective. So managing your water and, and going from there has a lot to do with it. Here are some values for <clears throat> drinking water for beef cattle uh, in various sizes of growth. And <clears throat> on the growing cattle um, and, and so forth, uh, lot sprinkling um, is something that's done in some operations. A uh, combination of, of uh, suppressing the dust as well as providing some cooling, uh, similar to what's done in the dairy where you wet the animals and go from there. But again, this gives you a ballpark of how much water you need per day to um, <clears throat> get through the system. And so how much water do you need is going to depend on, you know, the animals and things like that. Now, from the water quality standpoint is... <clears throat> what kind of water quality are required. And uh, you've got some uh, values that need to be for irrigation water, drinking water quality, um, <clears throat> monogastric animals like your swine or poultry uh, tend to be a little more um, sensitive to water quality or ruminants, beef cattle and dairy cattle. Uh, you don't wanna give them real poor quality water, but they're rumen. Uh, buffers, uh, some water quality challenges that you might have. Uh, salinity is probably one that you can't get away from. And then what's the water quality of the source, the water source? And in Missouri, uh, we've got some locations that are good groundwater. And we've got groundwater in parts of the state that is, is as salty as if you pumped it out of the Gulf of Mexico or maybe even worse. And so that gives you a, a, a spectrum. And then you just have to think about it, you know, what is your need, what is your quality, and then assess whether I need to look at uh, water treatment and then incorporate that into your design. Your quantity in general, estimate the water need based on the values. So those values that we talked about for the different uh, not animals uh, production stages, and then you add it up. Uh, peak water values based on the behavior, single animal drinking water rate. Uh, your, your animal management can get you those numbers. Uh, there are some preferences out there. Number of animals drinking at what time? And then what other water uses when the animals are drinking uh, and, and going through from there? And I've run into the situation where uh, the number of animals that are drinking at one time and the water supply was actually causing some health problems because of a mismatch between um, the amount of water being able to be supplied as well compared to uh, how many animals are trying to drink at the same time. Now, here's an example. Uh, it's a swine example, uh, a 1200 head wean finish facility, which is a pretty standard size in the, today. Uh, 40 pens, two drinkers per pen is kind of a standard layout. Uh, if you remember our numbers, four gallons of drinking water plus cooling and larger animals, the growing animals like to drink at about one and a half quarts per minute. So if you look at your daily need at 6,000 gallons, your, your five times 1,200. And if we're going to deliver that in 12 hours, and if we're doing a well system or something like that, that's probably a decent number. Uh, you want to have your supply that's strong enough, and that's 8.33 gallons per minute. But now if you look at your peak need, your 40 pens at three quarts per minute, um, you really need a 30 gallon per minute water supply into the building, but yet your daily need is only at 8.3 gallons or nine or 10 gallons per minute. So you've got this uh, mismatch, if you will, or it's not really a mismatch per se, but it's two different values that you've got to work with uh, from there. And depending upon how this quantity shakes out, we'll see how it impacts uh, where your water system uh, can come from. And so if you're looking at a well system, for example, you know, can, can the well determine the daily demand? And so there's a case of if your well can deliver nine or 10 gallons per minute, you're probably good. Uh, if not, 
if you've got five gallons a minute for a well and you got two wells at five gallons each, you're good to go and to apply it, do your daily supply. Now, can the well supply peak water use demand? So we're talking about, you know, a single well of maybe nine or 10 gallons, but the building needing 30 gallons per minute. And so the need for an intermediate water storage where the well fills a storage tank and then a booster pump provides that 30 gallons per minute into the building. So then you have the water supplied to the building as you would need uh, based on the peak demand. And then your well system catches up and fills the tank uh, from there. So that's kind of how you would put one of these systems together uh, conceptually and how the numbers start shaking out. And each facility and so forth can be different. In Missouri, um, uh, we, we have a lot of parts of the state that are surface water supplied. As a general rule, north of I-70 in Missouri is surface water, unless you're in a river bottom and can get a well in the river bottom. Otherwise, you're looking at surface water. And typically what's done is the pump from the reservoir or the impoundment to supply the building is the pump size to meet the peak. So the pump you put at the at the impoundment is going to be in our swine example 30 gallons per minute and then your your piping system then to match. <clears throat> Some of the things that um, need to be careful on and this is Missouri recommendations some values that I've used over the years that work out pretty well. Your impoundment should be large enough to store at least one year and better two years of water supply. So how much water do you need on a daily basis? You multiply it by 365 and then double it. So you have two years of water supply in your impoundments <clears throat> uh, for that. Because if you do get a drought, if you had a year, two year supply, you're good. You might be able to get through the thing. Uh, but then you also need to be ensured that the watershed area draining the runoff is large enough to fill the impoundment in a normal year. And as a general rule in Missouri, the rule of thumb I use is six inches of runoff per year on average. Uh, so you want to have enough <clears throat> watershed acres to be able to fill your impoundment or your impoundment system in a normal year so you can catch yourself back up. And when you have a larger operation, these can be fairly significant in size. And then what other water sources, surface sources can you need to refill the impoundment? And, you know, one of the ones is if you're thinking about water harvest off of uh, building roofs, uh, 100, an inch of rain on 100 square foot gives you 62 gallons of water. If you had a Freestall barn at 100 by 200, which our university has, we're looking at 12,400 gallons we could capture from that. But if you're in a riparian water, you can do that. If your water use, uh, being able to harvest water from a roof may or may not be something that you can do. So with that, I've kind of run through a lot of information. Here's some of my background and um, since we're taking questions at the end, I'll stop share and turn it back to Anne. Wonderful. Thank you, Joe. And that was a wonderful overview of uh, water systems for livestock management. Um, I'm impressed with the numbers you knew off the top of your head there in terms of uh, roof water accumulation. Uh, so now we're going to take a uh, switch over to hear from Will Boyer. Uh, Will is an extension watershed specialist at K-State Research and Extension. And Will's going to be uh, diving into the topic of moving water to where you need it when you don't have enough um, and how to, to manage that um, during drought time. So uh, Will, thanks for joining us today. I'll hand it over to you. Yeah, thank you, Ann. And I guess you can see that all right. Oops. Not at the beginning, so I better back up. You guys get a little preview there. Yeah, it looks great. <laughs> so, uh, let's see here. Get to my full screen and then this pointer thing.
Yeah, thank you. Um, so I've had great fortune over the last uh, 20 years to work with an outstanding group of extension professionals with just amazing experience. Uh, and uh, we as watershed specialists have worked with our uh, state water quality agency to, uh, to try to make a big impact on improving water quality associated with livestock. And a uh, big part of what we've done in the past is working with small feedlots, uh, winter feeding sites out in pastures, uh, and providing alternate water supplies so the livestock don't have to drink out of the streams to, to get their drink. Um, in the recent years, with all the, the buzz about soil health and cover crops, uh, we've been kind of charged with the challenge of, of trying to come up with uh, inexpensive watering systems to, to help provide water to, to cover crop fields uh, and, and other situations too, but, but uh, and, and inexpensive systems that since the, the cost of solar panels and, and equipment has gone down quite a little bit. So it's a really good opportunity. That upper left-hand corner picture is actually the, the first system that I, I put together in the recent years with a, a low cost system. Um, had some lessons learned and I'll point those out later. But then I was thinking about, about cover crops and, and water systems and, and there was a time or two in the earlier years that I, I did pretty much what we were talking about already, but we didn't call them cover crops. Uh, it was more of a forage crop or, or uh, just you know, crop residue. We did a lot. So that picture on the right, that was clear back in aught five. Um, one of the projects I worked on, we provided an alternate water supply in an adjacent uh, pasture. And then this uh, field of turnips was, was extra forage to help minimize the amount of time that the animals had to be in a feedlot. Um, so we don't, we haven't always called cover crops, cover crops, but, and then going back even farther in, in some history that I, I researched a little bit, uh, George Washington actually said there was two kinds of crops, crops that you, that you sell and that you eat. And then the other kind is ones that replenish the soil. So just wanted to back up a little bit and, and acknowledge that, you know, our, our earlier generations and, and our, our uh, earlier civilizations even had had a lot of important knowledge and, and we probably should slow down and think about what's happened in the past and, and move forward in the, in the future thinking about that. One more I wanted to, to, to mention too is this was, this was up, up north in that, that uh, now famous Pine River, Minnesota watershed that I keep hearing more about. Uh, my grandpa back in the 80s, I remember helping him and uh, we did what he was calling green manure crops. Uh, but uh, that was that was when he was getting his feet back under him after after those uh, bad times in the early 80s. So anyway, moving moving on, uh, acknowledge that importance of history and, and learning from that. Also want to acknowledge that that solar water pumping might not be the, the best way to, to get water to the animals and may in fact be just as good to, to let the animals come to the water too. So there's, there's some opportunities there that you can pursue if you're, if you're struggling to, to get water to where you need it. Uh, ag economist that, that helped on one of the first projects that I worked on in Kansas here pointed out that especially uh, in situations where we have you know, small pastures that might be you know, geographically isolated from other places, that hauling water is the most cost-effective way to, to get water to your animals. And that definitely could be the case in, in drought conditions. Um, and also I wanna point out that, uh, you know, if you have a reoccurring problem where you're, you're having you know, shortages of water periodically, trying to come up with a good permit solution is really important. Uh, if you have a source of, of AC power, that's really the most reliable option you have. Uh, if you have wells and, and are a reliable water source that you can pump water from. In Northeast Kansas and a, a large part of Kansas, we have uh, rural water systems that can be tapped into. 
uh, that's a monthly fee, but it's also an awful reliable supply of good quality water. Uh, the solar side, a lot of the, the systems that I'm working with are involved using batteries, but the most efficient would be having a large storage system, kind of like this water tank here. Um, so uh, having that and not having to rely on battery storage and, and locate uh, the storage tank up on top of a hill so you can do a gravity supply system from that. Uh, also in a drought situation or a, a temporary situation, uh, we might run water lines along a fence on, on top of the ground and uh, not bury them. So, but in a permit situation, burial is burial of the water line below the frost line is, is critical. So if you're running short of water, like in the upper right hand corner they are, there's just like Joe has mentioned, there's there's certain sources. There's impoundment ponds, uh, streams, uh, it's a source that we use a lot, uh, and wells. And, and, and good share of Kansas, we, we've got pretty good well water and can, can work with that. It's not always uh, high capacity, but for small livestock operations. And, and what I work with mostly is grazing operations on, on this. So it doesn't, doesn't always take a huge amount of water. Uh, you can get uh, solar panels now for less than one dollar per watt, so that's a hundred watt panel. Um, that charge controller that you see there says twenty dollars. You can probably get that one for even less than that, but the one that I like uh, is twenty dollars, and it has a little bit better uh, connections and and a little bit more solid uh, machine. And then, uh, especially if you're doing this in the winter time, having a, a really good deep cycle battery is important. Um, and, and in the summer, if you if you don't have plenty of panels and and the right setup, then then you still need a, a good deep cycle battery to make your system work. This pump on the left hand side is only about forty bucks, and and when we put one of these in a pond, that thing just It'll pump dirty water for a little while and it'll get cleaned up and, and it can just keep on pumping water that, that isn't you know, the best quality, but it is good enough for, for the animals, especially when they're thirsty. Um, and it's an impeller pump. The, the pump in the center is, is a helical rotor pump or a screw pump, a lot of people would call it. Uh, and it's a well pump. It's, Really, in sandy areas, it's, it can really be a problem. It'll wear out if you pump sand at all. Uh, and if it's dirty water, uh, you probably should have some screening. And that's a little picture of the extra screening that I put on that one. Uh, and then on the right is a diaphragm pump. And that's a surface pump uh, as opposed to a well pump. And, and uh, it does a, a real fine job of, of delivering water to to a distance as far off. That's kind of the advantage to having the, the pressure tank and, and a pressure switch system. And I'll, I'll note too that there are in, similarly inexpensive pumps for wells that are impeller pumps and uh, diaphragm pumps. And depending on the circumstances, you would pick one or the other. Um, we can talk more about that in detail later. There's a bulletin that we put together and I can put that in the what, chat later on here. I think I've got it on my clipboard here. Um, I use a lot of buckets. I go down to the recycling center and pick up some, some buckets there. Somebody was wanting to get rid of. Um, you can see down on the right hand side, we just drilled some holes in the bottom of it so we can drop that out uh, in a pond and, uh, and, and pump water and screen out some of the big stuff. And not, not try not to suck up any fish or anything. Um, and lots of times I'll put a lid on it and maybe a, a swimming noodle around it so it'll float too, depending on the circumstances. Uh, you saw that real, real uh, muddy, murky pond earlier. It looked like it didn't have enough water in it to water the cattle very much longer, especially if they're, if they're walking or tromping around in it. But uh, it'll surprise you how much time and, and extra water you can get out of a, a pond that's, that's about dried out with this little uh, low profile intake here with about quarter inch holes in that top piece of pipe. Um, 
and that that uh, suction hose that you see has got a foot valve on it. We just slide that out uh, into the deepest part of the pond and use that surface water pump. In a more permanent situation, uh, and a situation where the pond's got more water in it, we'll, we'll slide out and it takes similar to this. Uh, and then more of the ideal uh, situation for pumping out of the pond will look kind of like this with that intake riser out there, the deepest part of the pond, and then a horizontal pipe coming over to what's essentially a, a, a intake similar to what a well would be, where you can put a submersible pump into the into the pipe and then come out the side uh, with the pitless adapter and stay underground the whole time and, and be able to use that system uh, all year round. Uh, up on the upper left is, and both both these items on the left are, are inexpensive uh, means to be able to to utilize and control the pump uh, and get optimal performance from uh, the pump during periods of, of either clouds or the time when the sun's just coming up or just going down. Uh, it's a linear current booster is what they call this one. It, kind of helps to optimize the power to, to your pump. Uh, the two on the right are both timers and they actually, I hadn't run into many people that had used them, but I'm a big fan of using these timers. Uh, one thing they allow you to, to, to pump water a long distance uh, without having to have something to control the, the water level in the tank. And then the one on the bottom, is is an interval timer and the, the good thing about it especially when we we're talking about uh, uh, drought situations if you have a low producing well uh, you could set up your pump so uh, this timer could could fix it so it would only run for five minutes at a time and then rest for for 10 so the well could fill back up and you can keep pumping water you know 24 7 if you have a battery because of course you can't pump at night with you just have solar panels uh so you get you get uh, all the water that you can get out of a poor producing well and then to control the water level in the tanks uh there's floats that have have a low amp carrying capacity and if, if that's the case or if you have a, a high amp draw pump you, you may need to have one regardless to uh, this relay system uh, similar to what you find in vehicles uh, that allow you to use a, a low power supply to tell the pump when to turn on and off and then send a big power supply to the pump. And then you don't burn, burn up your, your float system. Uh, this one is a tethered float and that one and, and the one to the right that's, that's upside down and I put it upside down. It won't be upside down if you download the slides, but it's upside down for you here. Uh, it's one that's used in boats, the, a bilge pump that pumps water out of the bottom of the boat. So in order to fill the tank and turn the tank, the pump off when the tank got full, you have to flip it upside down, but it, it works pretty good. And the good advantage to that is that in a stock tank out in Kansas, when the wind's blowing, there's a lot of waves. And, and you know, there's waves at the bottom of that boat too, and it's rocking around, they've got it set up. so that float can, can do quite a little moving up and down without actually turning the pump on and off. And, and that's one of the worst things for, for a pump is, is that on and off all the time. Uh, I like that one a lot over the tethered float, uh, mainly because that tethered float, your, your tank has to get about halfway empty before it'll turn on. Uh, and in both cases, uh, you need to have these systems fairly close to the, the tank and the and the solar pumping or the solar panel needs to be fairly close to each other uh, because you're basically running the current uh, that's going directly to the pump all the way through this wire. And if you have uh, small wires, which they only put smaller wires on it than I like, and a long distance, then you've got some voltage drop and your pump capacity is going. 
Hey, Will, I apologize for interrupting. I just wanted to give you a little warning. I think we have just like two to three more minutes because um, we right. have a few questions in. Yep. So the two on the right are uh, uh, Hudson and a Joe float valve. When you use uh, a tank a long ways away, this is the best system uh, to turn the pumps off with, with uh, pressure tank systems. In the summertime, you, you got to you can put them about anywhere in the winter time they've got to be protected and i know that's not protection enough for people in that north country but good enough for us uh running here's an example of running the poly pipe uh, over the top of the ground it's a better system and uh, to bury it shallow in the ground or deep uh, if you only need it in the summertime shallow burial works uh, you got to worry about uh, the, the pipe can freeze and not break, but those little fittings that you see on the right can break. Uh, spreading the cost out by making the, the solar pumping system portable can, can help a lot. This is a, a guy that called me two weeks ago and he needed water, his tank, his pond was, was going empty and, and it wasn't raining. We set this up in one morning, just real quick and got him down to, to the drinking spot. The next, this pond and the next couple are ponds that uh, actually we've had drought last fall and, and this early this spring and not as much lately, but uh, when when the ponds get full of silt and the weather gets dry, then everybody starts cleaning their ponds out. So we've got three of them that we're doing this year here in my immediate area. This is another one. They didn't totally rebuild this one. They just put an excavator out and filled uh, cleaned it out good. That's one of those tethered floats. And then this one is going to have some uh, more sophisticated uh, winter summertime system between here and the cover crop field up on the hill. Uh, the big thing that I think has been a big part of our success is the watershed specialist program is getting in there and helping producers uh, implement the, the best management practices and, and uh, we're not afraid to get dirty. Uh, this bottom set of pictures is some freeze prevention that I kind of coined as being a frost-free hose pit. Uh, it's kind of like that wet well, but actually the pump goes out in the water supply. And uh, up on the top is a camera that's connected to the cell phone connection. So that gives us, gives us the opportunity to, to see if everything's working from the distance. Um, and then in, in dry and hot weather, uh, you know, your, your only solution might be one that's got a bad history of, of algae growth and blue-green algae is awful dangerous. And uh, another thing that's been a good part of our program is our close relationship with our local extension agents. Uh, and one of mine really wanted to do something to, to address the blue-green algae issue. And uh, we came up with this uh, slow sand filter system to, to treat the water. Uh, before the livestock drink it. It's pretty, pretty good deal. That's my last slide and sorry if I took a little bit long. No, not a problem at all. Thank you so much. I'm really interested in that last piece about the, the sand and filter. Um, well, uh, we do just have a minute or two left. I think we can maybe take one or two questions from our uh, for our presenters, um, we will also provide their emails as well if folks have a burning question that we aren't able to get to here today. Um, we do have a question for you, um, uh, Shinwa. The, um, ben Crockett is curious if there were observable yield differences for the crops between the 1030 and 60 MAD treatments uh, in your experiment. Uh, the answer is yes. Um, we did um, some experiment for watermelon uh, previous three years. Uh, so when the treatment is different, um, actually we found the you know the thirty percent um, more of the management depletion C has a higher yield and a better quality. Not the one that's with ten percent. Great, thanks. And do you have a recommended uh, source for uh, analog or non-electric inline flow meters? Um, 
the answer is no. It's yeah. everyone's situation is different. Yeah. Uh, so, um, you know, previous years we did an experiment with a battery powered uh, controller. And then, you know, this year uh, we have this system. And as I said, you had to really know what kind of field you have, what situation you have, and then you can train it down. And, and then find out which controller really works. But if you need help, you can email me and we can definitely help out. Great. Maybe our last question here before we close is uh, for Joe, is there a network of other resource or other resource for connecting with ag water engineers like yourself and other parts of the country? I wish there was. Yeah. Um, if you, uh, another, another, a uh, place to look is uh, if you can get in contact with a with a, a water systems engineer. Sometimes your metropolitan, your cities have a uh, an engineer on staff, and the the kinds of things that I do are very similar to public water distribution systems. It's just targeted for ag, so the calculations and the theory is the same. So maybe you can find somebody who's familiar with applied water water system design in your local area that could that could help you out but as far as a database of ag engineers that know how to do water systems there's not that i'm aware of sorry <laughs> yeah absolutely and i know um, in the chats folks are saying maybe a local as abe uh, meeting or something like that along those lines um, I also would note the North Central Region Water Network. You know, not everyone that's a part of the North Central Region Water Network is an ag engineer, uh, a water engineer, but certainly we do have some that are part of the network. So reaching out to, to us and our network, as well as the state point of contact to maybe put you in touch with them. They would certainly know if there's an extension ag water engineer kind of counterpart to Joe in, in your state in the North Central Region. Well, thank you so much to our presenters. I really appreciate that. That was excellent presentations and each one covering a little bit different angle on water management during droughts. So I really appreciate you taking the time to present today. I apologize that we you know, just ran out, ran out of time as there's so much to talk about. Um, our presenters' emails are up on the screen there. Like I mentioned, if you have a, a burning question that you weren't able to get answered today, you can feel free to reach out to them directly and I'm sure they'll be able to, to connect you or to provide an answer. Uh, as a reminder, the, this webinar is recorded and the webinar recording as well as the PowerPoint slides will be made available on our website, northcentralwater.org, uh, shortly after the, today's presentation. And I also want to let you know about an upcoming uh, presentation from our soil health team. We have a soil health team at the North Central Region Water Network, the Soil Health Nexus, and they have an upcoming presentation uh, next Wednesday at the same time, 2 p.m. Central, uh, talking about how to interrogate the soil. So uh, go to soilhealthnexus.org if you are interested in registering for that. So I think that's a wrap, everyone. Thank you so much for, for taking your time out today. Uh, thanks to each of our presenters and thanks for everyone for joining us to talk about water management during drought. Thank you.